Now we're going to finally move into talking about quantitative mass relationships and chemical reactions and really how to think about planning chemical reactions from a mass perspective. How much of reactant A do I need to use, for example, to get product C out? Or how much reactant A do I need to use to fully consume reactant B? Questions like this. Questions like this are answered using the tools and concepts of stoichiometry. And stoichiometry is a fancy word that really just means the mass and mole relationships associated with chemical reactions via chemical equations. And balanced chemical equations, this is a point we'll come back to again, are really the foundation of stoichiometry. You've got to have a balanced chemical equation to work from to get into stoichiometry problems really at all. And they are the bedrock. They are the foundation. So the definition of stoichiometry is given on this slide. It refers to the study of quantitative relationships between substances involved in a chemical reaction. And in, in terms of the balanced chemical equation, there are really two pieces of this that matter to us. The first is the identity of the species involved, the reactants and products, via their formulas, because these tell us things like the molar mass and the formula mass of the reactants and products, which are, is important for going from mass to moles or vice versa. But the other piece that's really important are the so-called stoichiometric coefficients, these numbers that come before the identities of the reactants and products that tell us the ratios in which they combine. And this idea of those factors as ratios and, and the idea that we can combine the coefficients to form factors that are ratios is, is highly useful for stoichiometry. So the example I'm showing on this slide actually has nothing to do with chemistry, but looks more like a recipe for making pancakes. One cup mix plus 0.75 cups of milk plus one egg gives eight pancakes. This is a perfect analogy to a balanced chemical equation. We've got the ingredients, we've got the final product, and we've got the amounts in which the ingredients combine and the amount of products, pancake product, that's formed as a result of this. What we can do with this recipe, this balanced chemical equation, is form ratios that we call stoichiometric factors of the various ingredients and the, the pancake product to, to suit various purposes, to solve various problems associated with these questions that we've asked. How much mix do I need to make 20 pancakes, for example, or how much mix do I need to use up three eggs that I've got in my refrigerator? These stoichiometric factors are the tools really we use to answer these questions. And they come from the balanced chemical equation just as ratios of the stoichiometric coefficients and the identities of the ingredients and products or the reactants and products, if you like, involved. So for example, one egg for every 0.75 cups of milk. That's an example of a stoichiometric factor. One cup of mix for every eight pancakes. And you can see how these ratios will help us answer various questions. If I want to know how many eggs does it take to use up a particular amount of milk, I can use this first factor, one egg for every 0.75 cups of milk. If I want to know how much mix do I need to, to make some number of pancakes, I can use the second ratio, knowing that I need one cup of mix for every eight pancakes that I'd like to make. So the stoichiometric factors we'll use throughout our study of stoichiometry and chemical reactions, but I hope this pancake analogy really drives home that the balanced chemical equation in the context of stoichiometry, it's nothing more than a recipe. And just as we would use the idea of ratios within a recipe to figure out uh, answers to these various stoichiometric questions in a cooking context, we can do the same thing in a chemistry context. And balanced chemical equations are really the foundation of this. So this slide gives us an idea of the various things we can calculate really starting from a balanced chemical equation, which isn't shown on the slide, but really is, is, as we just saw, what gives rise to all the various stoichiometric factors. So the stoichiometric factor is a conversion factor between moles of A and moles of B. A and B might be reactants or products in the chemical equation. From those, we can work outward using various other tools of stoichiometry to other quantities, using, for example, molar mass to go to a mass of A or a molarity to go to a volume of a solution that contains A, or even Avogadro's number to go to the actual number of particles of A involved in a chemical reaction. 
we could go from the mass of A to the volume of pure A using its density. And of course, all those corresponding calculations for B as well. And so you can see how just starting from the balanced equation really and working in one direction or another, we can flow from the mass or volume of any reactant to the mass or volume of any other reactant or product, or go from product to reactant for that matter, using these tools in, the, in what I call the stoichiometry toolbox, things like molar mass, the stoichiometric factors. You'll hear these referred to as mole-mole ratios. Also, uh, Avogadro's number, molarity, and even density can be thought of as a player in the stoichiometric toolbox as well. We dug in pretty deep with the pancake analogy, but let's try to bring this back to a chemistry context by looking at an example problem. So let's imagine that we were working with the chemical reaction between magnesium chloride, NgCl2, and sodium hydroxide, NaOH, in aqueous solution. This gives a product of solid magnesium hydroxide and aqueous sodium chloride in the ratios that you see here in the balanced chemical equation. And the question here is, what mass of sodium hydroxide is required to produce 16 grams of magnesium hydroxide according to the following chemical equation. Now, with, with stoichiometry problems, by analogy to what we've done previously in terms of drawing a picture, what I like to do with these is to map out the flow of quantities before I ever calculate anything so that everything is laid out in terms of my process before I actually start plugging in any numbers. This will help you diagnose errors, it will help you make fewer errors, and it will help you become a more generalized problem solver, being able to translate one approach to a different context very easily. So here, what we know, and I always start with what I know, what we know is the desired mass of magnesium hydroxide product, 16 grams. What I'd like to know at the end of this is the mass of sodium hydroxide that um, is needed to produce this mass of magnesium chloride, of magnesium hydroxide, sorry. And in order to do that, really in order to do anything in a stoichiometric context, we need to go through moles. If we think back to this, if you look back at this flow chart actually, you'll see that everything goes through moles if I'm trying to get from one side of this diagram to the other. I have to convert a mass of A to a moles of A, then to moles of B, and then on to whatever form of, of B, whatever expression of the amount of B I need. Everything goes through moles because of the centrality of the stoichiometric factor or mole-mole ratio in these calculations. And so one of the things I like to say, and I think I've said this once before already, is get yourself out of what I call mass land or laboratory land as early as possible in a stoichiometry process. So going from grams to moles, we've moved into what I call mole land. And this is really where stoichiometry lives, where we can think about numbers of molecules in a more concrete way than using mass, where molecules have different weights and that complicates our thinking. Once we're at moles of magnesium hydroxide, it's just a matter of using a stoichiometric factor to go to moles of sodium hydroxide. And we're gonna use the balanced chemical equation to generate that factor here in a second. And then once we have the moles of sodium hydroxide, of course, we can then go to the mass of sodium hydroxide. So this is the process we're gonna follow mapped out from our starting point at mass of magnesium hydroxide to our end point, the mass of sodium hydroxide. How do we get across each kind of stop is the next thing we wanna think about. And so grams to moles, well, that's a molar mass deal. And it's dividing by the molar mass of magnesium hydroxide or multiplying by the moles of magnesium hydroxide per gram of that substance. That will give us the moles of magnesium hydroxide. To go from moles of magnesium hydroxide to moles of sodium hydroxide, we use a stoichiometric factor, and that comes from the balanced chemical equation. We'll see that two moles of sodium hydroxide are required to produce one mole of magnesium hydroxide. So this ratio is gonna look like two to one when we actually plug it in uh, to the calculation. And then finally to go from moles to grams, well, this is just molar mass again, multiplying by the molar mass of sodium hydroxide. So only now after we've mapped out our process do we actually start plugging in numbers. That mass that I was given was 16 grams of magnesium hydroxide. I'm gonna now multiply by the moles of magnesium hydroxide per gram of that compound. The molar mass is 
grams per mole, and I encourage you to verify this on your own. And so here's our multiplication factor to get moles of magnesium hydroxide. So we're now at stage two. To get to the moles of sodium hydroxide, we multiply by this mole-mole ratio, two moles of sodium hydroxide, there it is, consumed for every one mole of magnesium hydroxide produced. And then to get from the moles of sodium hydroxide to the grams of sodium hydroxide, we multiply by the molar mass of that compound, which is rather famously 40 grams of sodium hydroxide for every mole of sodium hydroxide. When we multiply all of these numbers out, one thing to notice is that the units cancel nicely. So grams cancels with grams, moles magnesium hydroxide with moles magnesium hydroxide, moles sodium hydroxide with moles sodium hydroxide. And so the only units we have left are grams of sodium hydroxide. And specifically, 21.95 grams of sodium hydroxide are required to produce 16 grams of magnesium hydroxide. That last problem was all about relating the mass of a product to the mass of a reactant. We can also relate masses of reactants together via stoichiometry, and that's the idea in this problem. So again, we have a balanced chemical equation for the reaction between octane and oxygen, which happens inside the internal combustion engine, to give CO2 gas and H2O, liquid water. And the, the stoichiometric coefficients here are given it's a nice exercise in this case to make sure that this equation is balanced as written. You can take my word for it or you can do it yourself. And the question is, what mass of oxygen gas is consumed when 702 grams of octane are combusted or are consumed? So we have an amount of octane consumed and the question is, how much O2 goes along with that 702 grams of octane uh, in terms of consumption when this reaction takes place. So where we are is grams of octane and where we'd like to go is grams of O2. And again, let's map out our process. Can't go directly from grams to grams. We have to go via mole world. And so the first step is to convert the grams of octane into moles of octane using the molar mass. Then we're gonna use a stoichiometry factor, stoichiometric factor to go from moles of octane to moles of O2 using these coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. And then finally, we're going to use the molar mass of O2 to get from moles of O2 to grams of O2. And so let's map out our process here times the inverse or reciprocal of the molar mass of octane gets us from grams octane to moles of octane. Then we're going to use the mole-mole ratio, moles of O2 divided by moles of octane coming from these coefficients. Again, 25 to 2. And then finally, we're going to multiply by the molar mass of O2 to go from moles of O2 to grams of O2. So now let's actually plug in numbers and see what this looks like. So 702 grams of octane is what we were given times one mole of octane for every 114.23 grams of octane. That is the molar mass of octane. And again, I would encourage you to verify that on your own. The Stoichiometric factor here is 25 moles of O2 consumed for every two moles of octane consumed. So 25 moles O2 divided by two moles octane. And then the molar mass of oxygen is 32 grams of oxygen for every one mole of oxygen. And here again, we can check that the units cancel. Grams of octane per grams of octane, moles of octane per moles of octane, moles of O2 per moles of O2, leaving us with the only units left grams of O2, and specifically 2,460 grams of O2, or just with a little bit of a conversion to a more human-friendly number, 2.46 kilograms of O2 are consumed in the combustion of 702 grams of octane. There it is. So this problem shows us how we can relate the masses of different reactant reactants that are consumed in a chemical reaction via stoichiometry.